we have multiple challenges in conservation biology, right? M multiple things that are stressing out our biodiversity, et cetera. One of the key ones that um, is often overlooked is just outright taking too many organisms, right? And so, and so I'll show you some definitions in a second for what I mean by exploitation, but basically this means taking too many individuals from a population, right? And so the classic one, I, ha I had one of my lectures that I uh, usually have my coastal students watch, but it's relevant to this, which is um, uh, whaling, the history of whaling. So I hope you guys watch that um, on our um, viewings page. But uh, if not, go, you should go back and watch it. Um, but, uh, and I started that particular lecture a little bit, and I said you guys could start in, because we will go over the early part of that uh, in, a, in a few weeks. But, but um, over-exploitation. So this is, this is a humpback whale. Um, and this is um, at our, our last active whaling station in uh, Richmond, which was basically functioning almost up until my, um, till when I was born. So, so this is in the San Francisco Bay Area. And this, by, by an active um, whaling station, what I mean is people bringing in whales all the time, like boom, 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 like a normal occurrence, just like someone bringing in salmon or, or squid or whatever. So um, this is not a, a long dead thing. This is a thing that's still going on. Okay, so for today's lecture, we're going to talk about a bunch of different things to make sure we get the, the, the full picture of overexploitation. Um, I want to start, though, with two examples of things, and then we'll get into definitions and, and talking about um, the potential for humans to overexploit uh, a species. Um, yeah, okay. So this is uh, the middle of almost nowhere, right? Fairly close to Madagascar. This is the island of Mauritius. I don't know why that didn't show up for you guys. The island of Mauritius. So this is a you know, small, um, small um, island, relatively far from things, not a whole lot going on. And it, is, it was the home of the dodo. So you guys might have heard about dodos. Right? In, uh, what, have you guys heard about dodos? What, what have you heard about dodos? Let me ask you that. It's a bird. They're like a dinosaur. They're like a dinosaur? I heard they're from Canada. Heard <laughs> they're from Canada. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yes, they're, they're, they're not from Canada. But, um, uh, but, that, but maybe how that, how that came to be is that dodo has entered into our lexicon. Dodo has entered into sort of common language or, or sort of... Uh, 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 Nicknames and things of that nature, and so that maybe that's why. They, any, anything else you guys have heard? They like didn't have any natural predators. They were seen as very like, for lack of a better word, like dumb. They would just be like wandering around. Yeah, that that's the that, that that's where we get the idea of dodo meaning stupid or dodo meaning um, not very smart, right? It's like you do, you, you dodo. I mean you you stupid kid. You know that kind of that kind of meaning. So um, one of the best books on it is by um, the science writer David Quammen, and, um, and he says in, in his uh, uh, famous book on the dodo, where he reconstructed their life history and talked about um, uh, their ecology and all that kind of stuff, um, the song of the dodo, if it, has one, if it had one, is forever unknowable because no human from whom we have testimony ever took the trouble to sit in the Mauritian forest and listen, meaning we've lost that a classic case of what we lose when we lose diversity. So we lose both the, 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 the organism, but then all the other doings that that organism engages with, right? And so we don't know what this bird sounded like. Clearly it made some kind of noise, but we don't know, was it like ugly and weird? Was it staccato like a crow? Was it very melodic like a songbird? We just don't know. And so again, this is, this is the, the source of thinking that they're from Canada or thinking they're from whatever. And so, um, firstly, it has a kind of funny name. Dodo is kind of just, it says, sounds funny in our tongue, right? We don't know where it comes from, but the best guess is that it comes from a, um, a sort of bastardization of a Portuguese word um, that means foolish, or a Dutch word that means, um, you know, slow. Um, in any event, this is, the, this is the, the notion that it has. Dumb lame, you know, kind of loser, that, that, kind of, um, that kind of thing, right? 
<coughs> so what, what happened with this critter? Well, in the early 900s, um, sailors from Malaysia and from the Arab Peninsula first find this island, first discover this island, start checking it out, land on it, start, start um, exploring it. Um, and so uh, they clearly come into contact with dodos around nine, in the 900s. 1500s, early 1500s, the major European powers start to arrive, the colonial powers. Um, and they first like, hey, there's a big fat chicken-like thing, chicken slash turkey kind of size thing. I'm gonna, let's, let's eat it, right? Um, so again, when these folks are traveling across the, the ocean, they're on rations. And so when they would get to islands, the first thing they do is get fresh water and get some food and replenish themselves. So one of the first things they would do is just start shooting stuff, right? Because they're, they're hungry. Um, but the other thing that we do with, with these vessels, and this has also happened with our islands here and pretty much all islands around the world, we get there and then we, uh, so the first one, hunting would be a, a exploitation, right? But then we, we start these other factors at play. Other factors are intentionally introducing some critters so a lot of sailors would release goats or pigs. They, 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 they would carry on board the ships and they would release them on an island with the idea being that those animals would go feral, reproduce, and then when the sailors came back there, ah, there'd be a bunch of pigs for us to shoot or a bunch of goats for us to shoot or whatever it is, right? So that was the intentional introduction of organisms. But then there's also all these other things that came along not necessarily intending to, the classic one being rats, right? And so these rats, w which were living on the ship when the sailors would start to frequent these particular islands, sometimes those rats would escape and get established on these islands, and now they, they become a novel predator. So Izzy, I think it was the one that said, oh, you know, they didn't, they didn't, these birds didn't have uh, terrestrial predators, so that maybe they weren't, they hadn't evolved defenses to deal with that, meaning that they built their nests on the, on the ground, for example, right, where rats could easily get to them, that kind of stuff. Um, and then once people like started like, uh, you know, living on the island, they started clearing the forest, and the forest was key habitat for the dodo. So, in, so we have this over-exploitation going on along with other stressors, other stressors, habitat loss, um, uh, competition or predation from um, uh, novel critters, etc. cetera. It, it's not described, the organism is not described until the late 1500s. Um, within about 100 years, it's gone. So within a century of its being described, it is extinct, functionally extinct, ecologically extinct. So much so, kind of like our story, if you remember back to um, Gilgamesh and, the, and translating about where stuff goes, people thought it was, it was, it was fake, it wasn't real. It was, a, it was a, a made up story to tell kids and things of that nature. Um, and by the 1800s, uh, people thought it was fake until someone, again, went into a cave and found some bones and were like, what the heck is this? And this sort of causes a mini sensation. And so Lewis Carroll, when he's writing Alice's Adventure in Wonderland, um, and, this, and he's, he's at this um, you know, famous British university, and he actually goes across the way to the Natural History Museum and he sees some of the bones some of the remnant tissues of this, <coughs> of this bird, and that's what he builds into. Um, so he creates all these, th this sort of iconic representation you see on the lower right, and that's where most of the world gets their, their uh, broad introduction to this now extinct species, dodos. And so, so the dodo is a key player in this exotic, weird, crazy world of Wonderland. Um, this is the, one of the first sketches we know about them, uh, about, about from the area. And you see a dodo in there. And it looks relatively big, right? It looks relatively big compared to the trees and the people and stuff. Um, this is a reconstructed one that I saw, um, again, in that Oxford Museum. Um, and this is just about all we have left. 
of this critter. So the feathers and everything that I'm looking at, that's a recreation, that's a best guess. These are, these are the parts, these are the, the remnant parts that we have. So it's a pretty good sized bird, right? It's like a, at least the adults are, you know, full grown or on the order of like turkey size, right? So we lost the dodo. This is what we think we know about them. The adults were about 20 kilos. They couldn't fly, so they were a flightless bird, kind of like a kiwi. They nested on the ground since they couldn't fly. And they laid a single egg in a nest of grass within these really heavily forested reaches of this island. Journals from those early visitors suggest that the mothers raised the young and, and were, would defend the nest with a big, strong beak and bite anybody coming uh, nearby. Um, and the colors also they were, were described by them. And the feathers were actually quite beautiful and, and, and gray and yellow and stuff. So actually they would kill them for uh, their feathers to, to use them in, in different decorations and things. They're very stubby, and so they, they weren't really like, a, like an ostrich or something, even though it was a ground-dwelling bird. It wasn't like a, a fast runner type thing. And, and it seems to be um, stubby, short, powerful legs to dig, to, to excavate stuff. Um, not sure what they ate, although there's been a lot of work in recent decades on this, but initially we were not sure what they ate, um, but there are reports of some of these birds in the surf zone, uh, harvesting fish and, and maybe eating fish, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, most importantly, they're described as swallowing stones. So some birds, um, like our, our barn owls, the reason why we study barn owl, one of the reasons we study barn owls is because they don't have a crop, meaning they don't have any a muscular pouch to, to squeeze stuff. Um, some birds have a crop and some birds will swallow stones because they don't have teeth like you and I would have teeth. And so they use this muscular, they use these little small stones in their, in their muscular throat like this to, to, amacer, to macerate, to squish, to break up prey. Is that the same reason like sea lions and like alligators and stuff will eat rocks? Uh, different. So, so, so yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't know if I have not seen that. So interesting. I don't know. Um, but definitely a different physiological mechanism if, that was, if that's what's going on. Um, uh, right. And so key is, um, is they, they're these ground-dwelling birds that have the ability to eat a lot of stuff, to, to grind a lot of stuff, right? So I'm get, getting the impression, stubby, not very fast, stocky, right? You can see why maybe people thought they'd be good eating. Not only have we lost the dodo, but as a knock-on effect, when we lose some of these overexploited species, we lose their role in the ecosystem, right? And so in the case of um, uh, the dodo, we had this tree that used to be very widespread on Mauritius um, that is now um, hurting, shall we say, <laughs> right? So um, what we think was going on there is that the dodo was a key part, it, it co-evolved with this tree. So the dodo would, would take the seeds, you know, eat it, and maybe not get a lot of nutrition from the seed itself, maybe the pulp or the, the surrounding fruit, but the act of, with that big crop, with those stones, that muscular crop, et cetera, and or the digestive tract of this bird, would scarify, would scrape up, would prepare the seeds so that when the bird would poop it out, the seed could actually germinate and the tree could actually start to, to, to you know, begin to grow. And so uh, Temple tested this in 1977 where we don't have any dodos, so we can't test with dodos, but he, he found what he thought was some, something of an um, analogous critter, which was, were turkeys, and he found that when he fed these seeds that they, they couldn't get to germinate into turkeys, he started to get them to germinate. So support for that theory that there was this, this relationship between this tree and this bird. Um, the last known significant natural germination of this tree was hundreds of years ago when we had dodo. And so most of the trees that we have left are, not, are, are, are very old, hundreds of years old, right? We don't have, uh, up until people start doing some restoration stuff, we don't have any babies around, right? We just have big old honking old individuals. Um, and so now the island is mostly deforested 
and so we're not going to get dodos back and it's going to be very hard to recover these trees but at least now we can start to um, to maybe replant some of these uh, uh, trees at least in small groves but we clearly have lost the forest and so lose the dodo dodo lose the tree and then we lose the trees in the canopy and then we lose other things like um, this blue pigeon so we now have the phrase, in addition to like dumb as a dodo, dead as a dodo, right? Meaning it's gone, it ain't coming back. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is the passenger pigeon that you, I had that little short video about uh, for you guys to look at. So this is the passenger pigeon. This is, the, um, this is an amazing story. This is an, a crazy bird. Um, and so uh, this is... The main breeding range is up around the Great Lakes and sort of the New England area, that, that area in the orange. Although they were distributed from southern Canada all the way down to Texas, and pretty much um, Lewis and Clark reported them in, in Idaho. Um, a little, like you see the distribution kind of just barely touches Idaho. So um, not really a western phenomenon, but certainly a Great Plains, Midwest, East Coast, absolutely. These are major, major critters. Um, uh, the numbers are insane of how many individuals there were. Very hard to reconstruct, but on the order of at least billions, billions of these birds. And so, uh, so many different things. Um, uh, John James Audubon described them one time um, being a mile wide, a flock a mile wide, meaning you couldn't see through it, just pure black. These are little pigeon-sized birds, but nevertheless, so numerous that you couldn't see the sky through them, that went on for a day, right? The birds were flying past them for a day, a mile thick. I mean, crazy, crazy um, uh, abundances. They were so abundant that people were like, damn, let's get some pigeons, right? And so they, any, anybody here, any, any of you could easily kill, just sitting around today, a thousand, just, without even trying, not being an expert hunter, not being, because they were simply so dense. All you need to do is put up nets or shoot a gun in the air and you would get a bunch of them uh, 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 dead, falling on the ground. And that's what this illustration from 1875 is, is showing. Um, uh, other illustrations of hunting, so all kinds of, all kinds of manner of trapping, etc. cetera. Um, people would put up these massive nets that would entrain them um, huge guns that people would, would essentially like cannons, just kind of a boom, shoot out flak, shoot out shrapnel, and just take out you know hundreds at hundreds at a shot. Um, and so people thought this was great. Hey, let's go take let's let's go harvest these guys. They seemed so abundant that we couldn't possibly hurt them, right? That our exploitation couldn't be bad because there's they the skies darkened with them. And indeed, taking a couple hundred or a couple thousand wasn't going to have any effect, right? But we start to get very powerful. So here's the time. I got three slides here. So you can focus mostly on the white things I'm showing, right? So that I have a long timeline, but... So when European settlers come to North America, something on the order of three to five billion individual birds at any one time are, are probably in existence in that territory. One estimate puts this in terms of numbers of birds, upwards of 40% of all the birds in North America, all the bird individuals in North America were passenger pigeons, right? This is, this is insane how many individuals these guys were. Um, the first European um, we know to kill a passenger pigeon was in late 16, or early 1600s, excuse me. From, um, uh, and, and, but, but initially, 1600s, 1700s, not a, not a huge deal. Not, not a lot of impact on their distribution or abundance. Then, we hit the 1800s. So now we're a country. Now the U.S. is a country. We're pushing west. Westward expansion, all that, that entailed, right? Uh, slaughtering the native peoples, uh, transforming the landscape for agriculture, all that kind of stuff. And so the population begins to change as we Americans move west into more of the core of, its, of uh, passenger pigeon territory. In 1806, this one naturalist estimates something like 
you know, so, somewhere more north of two billion birds. You know, okay, cool. Audubon, as I mentioned, uh, des des described this one, um, he had many descriptions, but one of his descriptions talked about this one flight, this one, one contigu contiguous movement of a flock of these birds for three days nonstop. And he said, dung fell in spots not unlike flakes of snow. So it was basically just day in, day out, just bird poop. Just that that's how many birds were flying over, overhead. Um, then, a common thing we will see with our over-exploitation, 1830s, 1860s, we really start to tech. We really start to bring the technology. We'll see this again and again with fisheries, with whaling, with all this stuff. In the case, uh, the key, some key technologies in the context of the passenger pigeon exploitation are one, rail service. So we're laying railroad tracks into the western U.S. starting in 1830. And uh, by 1860, we'll have 30,000 miles of track. So this is allowing us to physically get to these areas, get there and get back very quickly. So back in the day, if we were riding on horses and we shot a bunch of pigeons in, I don't know, Ohio or something, right? Uh, you got to eat them or, or throw them away or whatever, right? But now suddenly with the rail uh, industry, it's possible to take some of, those, some of that meat and ship it elsewhere, right? So now we start to create markets and we start to be able to move the product around. So now there's maybe some incentive to start taking more. Yeah, Caleb. But like from that picture you showed us of the extinct bird, the thing is not very big. Yes, it's a, it's a regular pigeon size, yeah. So like why is it so popular to eat? There's like barely any meat on it. Okay, so, so Caleb's question is, it doesn't look very meaty. Clearly you've not had squab or not had chicken, right? So we have chicken. We have chicken, we, I mean, yeah, someone can roast a whole chicken, but when you go to KFC, you get a wing, you get a leg, you get a whatever. So um, this was, you know, maybe, maybe if you have a healthy appetite, maybe one of these isn't going to satiate you, but if you have two or three or four, it totally will. And when you can get thousands at a take, it's, it's like having, instead of having a big giant turkey, having like five orders of KFC or something, right? So that's the idea. That's the idea. What is the bottom left right here? So, oh, this is, um, this is uh, 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 drying them. So they've been shot and they're, 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 they're um, essentially, so this is before refrigeration. So a lot of times we do is you kill a critter, take its guts out so there wouldn't be any bacteria going on. And then usually it's a drying or a salting process to preserve the meat or smoking. Sometimes it would also be smoking. So all that is, is like before refrigeration, how we kept meat uh, lasting longer than, than uh, you know, just the day or so. Yeah. Um, okay, so when we have the rail service, now we have the ability to get, many more people can get to these places, can get to these critters, and when we create products from them, primarily meat, we can get them back out to other people to, to create markets. One, two, the telegraph goes in. So the telegraph is essentially instantaneous communication. So now we can start the, the network, the, the essentially the, the internet, if you will, of the 1800s goes in. And now, when you see a big giant flock in whatever valley, Iowa, or whatever, right? Back in the day, you, maybe you're by yourself, like, oh my god, there's a bunch of birds here. I'm going to shoot a few, but whatever, I, you know, it's me. Now, I can tell people, oh my gosh, there's a big flock over here. You guys should come over to this part of the state, or whatever, right? So now people start to be able to to communicate the location, and that allowed people to target in, especially commercial hunters and, and things of that nature. So the technology is a key aspect of this overharvesting. Um, by, by the middle of the 1800s, we start getting predictions that yo, 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 even though there's still a lot of these birds around, something bad is gonna happen. The rate at which we're taking these individuals, we need to stop this. This is, this is not going, of course nobody listens. Um, by 1851, we have the first tentative step at doing something, right? So we're already in basically crisis time. Now we start to do something and typically it is, it is very little and very modest, right? And so in the case of, of this first uh, legislation to protect passenger pigeons, it only refers to their nests and their eggs and it's only in the state of, of Vermont. Um, yeah, so then we have a, 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 an observation in, in sometime around 1860 that um, uh, 
we might have as many as a billion birds in this one particular flight over. And then 1860, after this era of technology, we start to see this catastrophic decline, catastrophic reduction in the number of individuals. The, the numbers just start crashing. So now we start seeing, instead of seeing billions nesting or, 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 or you know, half a billion in a flock or something like that, we're starting to see many fewer individuals. So the last sort of big one we see, or one of the last big ones we see is in 1871 in Wisconsin, where the estimation was 136 million birds stretched out over um, about a little bit less than 1,000 square miles, right? So that's still a lot of birds, but that's starting to come down. Um, and the Cincinnati Zoo opens in 1875, and uh, that's the, the U.S.'s second uh, zoo. And among its, among its first exhibits is a passenger pigeon exhibit. And so they start to exhibit passenger pigeons. Um, the last big, um, relatively big nesting we see is in 1878 in Michigan. Um, and, uh, and then everything just, that, that's, that's the last sort of hurrah. Um, uh, in 1888, uh, some people start to take some of these guys into captivity. Again, this, this is a classic thing we'll see over and over again. Um, they start to disappear, and, and as they're getting rare, oh, let's, let's do some kind of cultivation or let's do some kind of re captive rearing of these individuals. Um, by 1890, we estimate the wild population at a few thousand birds. So let me remind you, let's go back, right? So, so these guys are estimating in, in 1840 that we might have a problem, right? Um, uh, some, somewhere on the order of, you know, many billions in the 1400s, in the 1500s, in the 1600s, all the way up until the 1800s, right? Billions and billions of individuals. And now, uh, where am I? And now by 1890, by the end of the 1800s, we're a few thousand individuals. The last wild egg pe anyone ever discovered was in 1895. And then, after we don't have any more birds, then we start to see legislation. Oh, well, hey, maybe we shouldn't shoot them very much or whatever, right? So then, then Michigan does this first ban in 1897, way too little, way too late. Um, and the last bird in Canada was present in 1898. How do we know it? Because the guy shot it. Um, and uh, the last wild passenger pigeon is shot in the US in 1902. And then this guy that had been sort of doing some captive rearing sends the last female bird he has to the Chicago Zoo where they have a male bird. So it's Martha and George, uh, you know, named after the Washingtons. Um, and in 1911, George dies, leaving Martha as the last bird. And then and on September 1st, 1914, Martha dies. The species goes extinct. Didn't they have any babies? No. George and Martha were not romantically inclined. So great question, great question. So remember, uh, so there's talk, we, we talked earlier about the, the woolly mammoth meatballs and stuff, right? There's talk, hey, let's bring, the, let's bring woolly mammoth back or let's bring some saber-toothed cats back or whatever, right? Obviously, you could do that, right? We could put a baby mammoth genome inside an elephant and have that elephant give birth to the, to the fetus, right? But um, organisms exist in, in, a, in a time and place. Organisms exist in an environment, right? And so, so uh, the behavior of these birds, and this is Martha, this is Martha right here in the Cincinnati Zoo before she died. Um, all kinds of stuff are going on. This bird had tremendous impact on this ecosystem. Total, you know, the only reason these guys could live is because we had insane oak forests that produced massive amounts of acorns that these birds ate, right? These birds would denude whole crop lands. They'd land, and you can imagine, you know, 100,000 birds landing on your farm probably ain't gonna be great for your farm, right? So these critters, by their very nature, had huge impacts on things. And so one of the, and so one of the ways they survived predators, because not only could you and I shoot one out of the sky, uh, a hawk. Are you kidding me? What? Dude, I'm going to eat now. I like, whoomp, right? 
Even the lamest, lame, lame predator could get one of these guys, right? So they survived. They, one of the strategies they employed was just overwhelm everything, right? Overwhelm the predators. Overwhelm the competitors, you know, just by, by the sheer size of these critters. And so as we change that, as we reduce their numbers from billions to millions and millions to hundreds of thousands, that begins to change, right? So if I'm a wolf or I'm a hawk, I'm still eating. Ah, I'm getting the guy. But, but now the, the benefit to me as a pigeon of having a gazillion million neighbors around that are, somebody's going to take the hit instead of me, that's, that stops to happen. The same thing with breeding, same thing with reproduction. So just because we put two birds in a cage doesn't mean they're going to breed the same way that when you're in a flock of you know, 100,000 or something, uh, they would breed. Um, and so a uh, key thing here is, so this is a recent paper. This is a reconstruction using genetic stuff. Um, and this is kind of crazy. It's using genetic data from only three individuals from a museum. They, they tried to sample data from four, and they only got data from, uh, DNA from three. The specifics aren't important, but what I want to show you, this is relative abundance, and this is years before present. And what I'm trying to show you is it's not, nature is dynamic. And so what we think is going on, we think what, what happened now with these birds is there's this fluctuation. Can you guys all see this? doesn't matter the exact time scale, but just note that sometimes the ab relative abundance here on the y-axis is high, and sometimes it's a little bit lower, and higher and lower, and higher and lower. So what we think was going on there is uh, the, the, the oaks and the, and the habitat sometimes it was better than others. Some years was better than others. Some decades was better than others. And so what seems to have happened here is the human overexploitation corresponded with a time when the oak distribution was becoming rarer, right? And then humans were clearing the prairies of all this forest to convert it to farmland. So as again, with most things, we have the overexploitation happening and other things also layering on. So it's overexploitation is the big thing, but we have all these other factors. And so that, so the changing habitat also seemed to be what was going on. Yeah, Izzy. How did they basically estimate an entire population from just one bird? Or I guess three in this situation? Like, traditionally in my brain, like, you want more of the yeah. better. So how does that represent, like... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I don't do population genetics. So I, I yeah, it, there's a lot of modeling involved. It's mostly a modeling exercise. It's not really like looking directly at the DNA and then taking it. It's using the DNA to parameterize a bunch of assumptions in a model. But uh, beyond that, I, I, the conceptual point is that it, it suggests that there was fluctuations in the population. That's what I wanted to talk about. But good question, good question. Um, okay, and so this is what I'm talking about. So this is the habitat that the, um, this over-exploitation is taking place in. So here's 16, so the black, the dark is, is uh, forest, 1620, 1850, 1926, and today, right? So yes, over-exploitation was the key driver, but we have this other stuff going on at the same time, complicating, compounding, reinforcing, making things even crazier. And so we want something like 46% uh, of, the, of, North, of the lower 48 states being forested, and then by the time Martha goes extinct, we only have about a third or so of um, that area forested. And much of that is second growth, is, is, is recovering forest. Okay, um, we'll talk about this and then maybe we'll take a little break. So next thing I want to talk about is, so those are two examples, right? Those are a couple examples. Those are the dodo over harvesting and that was the, um, a passenger pigeon over harvesting or over exploitation. So let's run through a couple definitions here. Exploitation versus harvesting. Exploitation is removing organisms from the wild. So you could sometimes use the term hunting, right? But, but, but not, you can remove things without a gun, right? So, so exploitation is a better generic term for this. So exploitation, taking organisms or their, or their, uh, their products like, like sap, let's say, from a rubber tree or sap from a, a molasses a maple tree, um, and then harvesting is what we use for um, uh, pulling in 
uh, cultivated organisms. So something that we're either growing in a field or encouraging, helping like salmon in a, in a river that we maybe put some baby salmon in the stock the river with initially, that kind of stuff. Um, we can talk about uh, exploitation a couple different ways. Subsistence exploitation is what we do for local consumption, right? So people in the local area for, for food or for, for doing their life. Um, and generally speaking, subsistence is limited in space and time and te technology, generally. We can talk about recreational exploitation. And this is where we do it for fun. So this would be maybe um, people going out and, uh, and you know, tapping, tapping sugar maples in the uh, New England to get uh, sugar and then coming home and making sugar or something like that. Um, and then commercial, which is where most of the problem is, commercial is a for-profit uh, uh, exploitation. And this is where the incentives are such that we can uh, relatively easily, without, without good management, can very easily get into an over-exploitation uh, uh, situation. Okay, from harvesting, we have a couple different types of flavors of harvesting we can do. We can talk about herding, which is where we're, we're managing migratory animals, animals that are moving across the landscape. Agriculture, where we are fixed in a specific location and we've planted terrestrial critters and we are um, growing them to consume directly or consume something they produce, their seeds or something, let's say. Silviculture is growing of trees. Um, and it's similar to agriculture, but has a very different um, uh, management approach and, and uh, just a lot of different traditions and history. Uh, aquaculture is the cultivation of water-dwelling organisms, aquatic organisms. And if you guys watched any of our videos from, um, uh, maybe I'll share one with you from uh, New Orleans, where we built a, an aquaponic facility this time to help people grow fish in the Lower Ninth Ward, an area that was um, impacted by Hurricane Katrina and remains impacted to this day. Um, and then um, aquaculture is the generic term. If it, if it happens in salt water, we use the term mariculture. So that just is the same thing as aquaculture, but just in, in, in salty water, br uh, brackish or salty water. So there we go. Exploitation, wild stuff, harvesting, managed in some way, shape, or form. But both of them are taking organisms or products of organisms. Okay, so then with that said, we can talk about the intensity that we're taking individuals, removing individuals from the population. Underexploitation is a weird word. <laughs> uh, and it, it comes from this idea that we should be exploiting things by definition. So with the caveat that that's a weird term, uh, we'll just use it because this is the, the language of exploitation. So under a resource would be, or a species or a population would be underexploited if the removal rate was vastly lower than the replacement rate. So if we were popping out 100 trees in our valley a year and you and I were cutting down one, we would, you could call that under exploitation. Sustainable exploitation is also where we're removing um, fewer individuals than are being added to the population each year, but it's a bit closer, right? So maybe, maybe our valley is producing 100 trees this year, and maybe you and I are taking out 25 or 30 or something like that, right? So we call that sustainable exploitation. Over-exploitation, then, is where we take, we're taking too many individuals. So we're taking too, more individuals than the population can replenish uh, on a routine basis. Um, that's how, so in the context of these other terms, that's how we'd say it. Another way you can say that is that we reduce the population to the point that we had an impact on ecological functioning. So maybe it's habitat for birds and now it doesn't provide as much habitat for birds. Maybe it is uh, helping us d uh, 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 stabilize the soil during heavy rains and now we've taken so many individuals we're not getting that same level of soil protection, right? So you could use either, either way to define over-exploitation. 
once we get into this cycle of over exploitation then the next level are our various types of extinctions right so um, when we say something's extinct oftentimes we, we we're meaning the bottom most term here, which would be global extinction, meaning no living critters left on Earth. But there are uh, stages that lead up to that in terms of our, our knocking down to the population size. Ecological ex extinction is that, the, yes, we might still be able to find an individual out in the field, but the role that this organism played is vastly reduced. So the, the ecosystem functioning is, is essentially non-existent or, or, or virtually non-existent. So that's what we call ecological extinction. It's no longer serving its role in the ecosystem that it served before when it was at a higher abundance. Economic extinction is where the exploitation costs um, aren't worth it. It's, it. They're so rare, it takes us so much time or so much gas or so many days or so many people's hours, whatever it is, that it's just, it's not worth whatever we, the value we get from the thing, right? Uh, this assumes a so-called rational free market approach. I almost never have seen a rational free market approach with this. Let me say this again, despite what our economist friends say. What tends to happen is, oh my God, there's no more birds left, and it might take me six months to find that next bird, I'll do it anyway because there'll be a collector somewhere that'll say, oh, this thing's rare, therefore I want it. So the notion of things become scarce and then therefore people don't want to pay for it, that d rarely happens. And that our desire for the unique and having trophies and things of that nature um, usually mean um, economic extinction is, doesn't always kick in. Okay, uh, wild extinction just means there's, there's no individuals left out in nature, but they could be in zoos, let's say or you know, some way, shape, or form in captivity. And then of course, global extinction means not even in zoos, everything is dead and gone. So that is um, extinction. Now, there has been some news made lately. We talked about the woolly mammoth meatballs and, and there's some interest in, in certain things, right? The whole idea of Jurassic Park was built on the idea of sucking out preserved DNA and, and, and regrowing dinosaurs. So there is, is this movement around where people are talking about so-called de-extinction, meaning taking something that was extinct and, and using their, their genome or, or, or most of their genome to recreate the individual in a, in a modern analog. Um, maybe, but we haven't seen that happen yet. And again, even if we do, it's unclear if the ecosystem would actually support those individuals. Do you call it when an animal is believed to be extinct within the first three years of Oh, like, uh, we say, pre okay, so the question is, so what, what, what happens, when we, so, so after Hurricane Katrina, my friends and I went on an ivory-billed woodpecker uh, uh, expedition across southern Louisiana, um, looking for this bird that was, um, people suspected as being extinct, suspected as being this last one, globally extinct, but we weren't sure, right? And we kept getting these reports of like, well, maybe, like, <laughs> Pappy sitting on the on the on the porch, shot an ivory billed woodpecker, right? You're like, really? Did you, Pappy, did you really see one? And so, um, so the question is, are they truly extinct, or are there a few individuals persisting? And so, in that case, we would use the term presumed extinct until, right? And so, then what will happen is, at some point in time, one of the professional organizations, the the Association for Mammals or the Birders or the Amphibians, whoever, will eventually get together and they'll say either the IUCN, which we've not talked about yet, or, or some other group will get together and say, you know what, it's been 50 years, no evidence, lots of people looking, we're going to declare this thing extinct. Um, so, so we'd use, up until that point, we'd use the term presumed extinct. Is that what you're asking about? Well, the reason I ask is there was a news article I explained that a professor was going to Walmart and they saw uh, a dragonfly that was considered mm -hmm. to be like right. the dinosaur. Yeah. Just hanging out there. Yeah. What would you call that? It's rediscovered. Rediscovered? Yeah. So, um, and so we'll see this when we talk about the snail darter as well. Um, not to give away the story of the snail darter, but, but with the snail darter, um, we thought that this rare fish was only in this one little draw in this river. And 
essentially, again, to give away the, the story, we decided that screw it, we're going to dam it up, and, uh, and the fish um, we thought was going to go extinct. Turns out they actually, uh, a bit later, we found um, individuals in another segment of river. So they, there actually was more. There were more and more of them. And so that, that's a wonderful thing when that happens, but that doesn't always happen. And also, regardless for both these things, so regardless of if, we, if you and I go out and we find an ivory-billed woodpecker, which would be super cool, it's not going to change this. It's not going to change the, its role in the ecosystem. Even if we find another 100 individuals, it's, th those aren't suddenly going to become great pollinators, <coughs> great seed dispersers, great predators, whatever it is. So, so um, really, the, the thing we really are worried about is this ecological extinction, which again is the first level to happen. And that is easy to measure. There's no equivocal thing going on there, right? So yes, we might have a few ivory bills. There might be some of these dragonflies on the wall of this Walmart in the south somewhere or whatever, right? Which is cool, right? But ecologically, that dragonfly probably isn't doing a huge amount, right? If, 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 there's, if they're just that rare. Cool. OK. Um, OK, we'll f do this and we'll take a break. So um, as I mentioned before, um, some of the, the key things here are more and more people in an area or more and more people doing activities in an area and improved technologies. And those two things together are really powerful drivers of over-exploitation. Only habitat loss slash fragmentation is a greater threat in terms of our, our, our panoply of, of threats to stuff, I would argue. Over-exploitation is massive and massively underappreciated as well. Um, something on the order of 72%, this is, this, is, this is a bit, this is a few years old, so the number might be slightly different now, but, but on the order of you know, three quarters, we could say, of threatened or endangered species um, have gotten to that threatened or endangered status because of over-exploitation. So a large number of them are actively being targeted um, and, and, and harmed in that way. Um, we sometimes think of this as being a phenomenon of us, of modern America, of the Western world, of the 20th century. It absolutely is, but it has gone on for a long time, right? Those sailors that got to Mauritius, that wasn't a modern phenomenon, right? That was, that was back in the day. So this has been going on since humans have been getting to places. After the break, we'll talk about an example of that. Um, and as human populations grow, we want more things. And a classic thing would, would be here for a, a, a clearing of a forest, harvesting of the trees in a forest. Um, and we start taking a few trees, and then we get better and better and better. And pretty soon, we're really, really efficient at removing those organisms and knocking their numbers down. And we get into this very quick uh, a feedback loop of over-exploitation. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna start talking about the Pleistocene megafaunal extinctions. All right, uh, let's take a quick 10-minute uh, break. Ready, steady, go. Stretch your legs. <laughs> 